And so what we decided to do is to bring in a filmmaker. Jerry Potter has kindly decided to join us coming all the way from Alberta. He's an award-winning producer. He's been a contract economic staff for 27 years. And for the last probably four or five years, he has made, he has been making a documentary called In Search of Professor Precarious. And along the way across the country, he has found many and many of them. And in fact, on the way, several years ago in 2017, he stopped in at the APTPO office right after our round of negotiations. And he interviewed uh, some of you. Uh, and so we thought it would be particularly nice if he could come and show us some of the documentary and talk about the ways in which you can mobilize people, the ways in which you can make these important precarious labor issues public. Uh, and I think very concretely, things that, that we will be able to do. So, uh, thanks very much, and uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Jerry Potter. Hi. That's the name of the film. Uh, some of you will know me. I've been across Canada three times working on this film in the past three years. Uh, I call it a moving picture of a movement moving forward. That's a lot of movements. The, um, <clears throat> the story is pretty sad, right? I mean, I did it for 27 years. And you all know the stories from your own lives or from your friends or from what you've read even, I guess. Uh, Jamie's book, I hope. Um, <clears throat> so, and I've seen it too. Uh, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what I've seen and then I'm going to suggest some things that you might try. First, I'm going to talk about what I've seen. I saw a lot of precarious contract faculty, which is my favorite term. Everybody has their own term for these folks. I think precarity has to come in there somewhere. We're not just part-time, and we're not just contract. Anybody who has an agreement with anyone else has a contract, right? Even the permies have a contract, right? When I was in California, they said, we call contract faculty the permanent faculty. So you're confusing us. So I use the term precarious contract faculty. So I saw, we saw a lot of that, and we've heard the sad stories, and we have our own. And I have my own. But in those three years, I also saw a lot of movement forward. I saw people working together in incredible ways. I saw people speaking out and speaking up publicly. I saw people standing up for their rights. I saw people brave enough to be interviewed in my film, which takes a lot of courage because they're risking those contracts. And I saw progress being made. That doesn't mean we can sit back, but it does mean that it's not hopeless. And some of my friends are in despair over this situation. You know, I have friends who've been teaching 10, 15, 20, 30 years and are ready to, as Jamie said, leave, cut out. I don't think we should do that. Uh, I don't feel I've cut out, even though I quit. I said, after 27 years of teaching drama and uh, Screenwriting, I said, a little film studies when I was lucky, I, I said, no more contracts. And uh, I want to make a film about this. Um, I've been involved in contract negotiations, so I've been involved with a number of faculty associations. And um, there was just a lot to tell to one another, to the rest of the academy, to our students to administrators, administrators, to fellow precarious contract faculty, to permanent faculty, and, and most importantly, as Jamie emphasized too, to the general public, because they don't know. If we're invisible, it's because they just haven't noticed, right? And we need to make them pay attention. Uh, I'm going to show you now uh, a little teaser. 
thing. This is a system built on 70% of the work at least being done by people who are underpaid with no security, but who are still doing the same job you are. The colleges are looking at that, the college administrators look at that, and they know if we can get it cheaper, why wouldn't we go this route? But yeah, the job itself, I love the work. I love the students I work with, um, my coworkers I love. What's frustrating though is not knowing if I'm going to be working again, if I'm going to be doing this for another six years, um, is this ever gonna turn full time? Um, depending on my contract, I may or may not have benefits. Um, you're trying to support families. I am. Yeah, and that's nothing I have to consider for my children. Is I have three. Uh, they're all very young right now, so trying to put them in programs is sometimes difficult. Um, saving for their education. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Okay, so I promised you, I said progress was being made, and I did see lots of that. What's required for progress? I saw many, many, many examples of courage. I have over 110 interviews, and I have footage from the strike, which you just saw a little bit, the great college strike of 2017 in Ontario, 12,000 people out, the largest higher education strike in Canadian history. Uh, I saw many, many other examples of courage, and that's sort of an obvious one, you all know about it, but um, hard, easy to talk about, hard to do, right? We have to find it. Uh, I taught fine arts for many, many years, and I was always telling my students to find their courage. We have to find ours sometimes, and we have to help our colleagues find theirs, maybe more important. Uh, I saw broad coalition solidarity really working well. Uh, I did an interview with uh, Sylvain Marois, some of you may know him from Fenech in Quebec. Um, he spoke in passionate terms about around the year, shortly after the, year, the turn of this, this century, um, 25 different groups who worked in higher education, the SAGEPs, uh, the colleges, the universities, uh, permanent faculty, contract faculty, um, janitors, service people, support people, students, grad students, postdocs, everybody. They all met and they talked about what they needed. None of the union leaders were allowed to speak. Everybody else was allowed to speak. And uh, it was uh, coordinated by a journalist from Quebec. And they decided what they shared and what they wanted to see happen in the, in the future. And it, it it worked. Um, they set some goals, and within a few years, they had a 60% increase in contract faculty pay in Quebec. Uh, Quebec universities still have some of the highest um, paid contract faculty in, in Canada. They're only they're slightly above what you what you find at York and a couple of other major Ontario, big Ontario universities, where the unions have been very strong. Uh, not like that where I come from, in Alberta. I spent a lot of time in Alberta on this film, and I spent a lot of time in Nova Scotia, where people get about half what you guys are getting here at OAU. Um, <clears throat> I think it, it, it also requires uh, slaying some sacred cows, um, our own sometimes, the things that we have been taught to, to revere. Um, an example of that is I think we, we often make a distinction between university and colleges that, um, and of course there are differences, and there's a research emphasis in some universities or many of them that there isn't in our community colleges, but the differences are not as great as we think. We're not better than them. Um, we need to find alliances, and some of the most interesting developments I think are happening at the college level, the Ontario College folks. Um, with Opsu are doing some really interesting and brave work. Um, another sacred cow, I think, is, uh, don't throw tomatoes, tenure. 
I think what we have to look at with tenure, because it, there has been such a, uh, it, it's been fetishized. Um, it's becoming rarer and rarer. It's held out as a carrot for many of us. Many of us hang on because we think we'll get tenure at some point. But meanwhile, while it has happened, as Jamie is saying, um, fewer and fewer tenure positions are being offered. Uh, good jobs are being turned into bad, into bad jobs. And it happens over and over. And the bad jobs are our jobs. Not that we don't love what we do, because I love teaching, but I don't like being exploited, and I don't think any of you do. Um, <clears throat> the thing about tenure is, what is it for? It's for job security, it's for job stability, and it's for academic freedom. If you have some job stability, you may be able to speak out and say things that you're finding in your research or that you just think based on being a thinker that you want to say. Of course, as Jamie says, with us, uh, they don't have to justify not rehiring us. So if we offend a student or an administrator, we might be gone, right? Um, there's some really interesting cases of this um, being taken on in BC with some of the uh, Federation of Post-Secondary Educators. And in Quebec as well, from, but I need to know more about that because I know that some of the universities there don't have tenure, they have permanence. Um, one of the people I interviewed, Frank Costco from Vancouver Community College, Faculty Association, uh, it's one of the best unions I encountered, I think, one of the strongest. You have a great one here, by the way. This is a fantastic union. Um, their faculty association fought really hard and uh, for a long time, and it's taken many years, but they have a contract. Uh, they don't have tenure. They have what they call regularization, and regularization really is a permanent job. And uh, they have one salary scale, one grid scale, so they don't have permanent faculty on one scale and contract faculty on a different one, right, or in a different part of the contract. They have one scale. Uh, and by doing that, they've closed the gap. And the gap between what we get paid and what permanent faculty or continuing faculty or tenure track or tenure, what they get, that gap is really key, right? Because that's what motivates administrators to casualize all these jobs, to turn permanent jobs into casual, precarious jobs. They, make, they save money, right? The other aspect is flexibility, right? They can cancel courses and cancel your courses if they want. But, and that was a little harder one to take on. But I think we need to close the gap. And it, when we do close the gap, as they have at a place like Vancouver Community College, then there's no advantage for them to precaritize these jobs. They can't go cheap. So they're not undercutting the permanent faculty, as we are actually doing, right, by, ex by merely existing we undermine their bargaining position because we, we do the same thing for less, right? And that makes it hard for them to bargain, right? Uh, and we also, of course, are exploited. We're, we're cheap labor. Um, that's another sacred cow. I think what we have to go after is job stability or job security, if you want, and academic freedom, true academic freedom. At Vancouver Community College, after two years of a 50% load, you are automatically made permanent. And there's no committee, there's no dean has to decide this. And it cannot be changed. If the administration does not make someone permanent after two years of a 50% load, the union grieves it and they win every time. So. That's what we need to go after. We need to close that gap. Now, they still haven't closed the flexibility gap because, well, they have a seniority system. And you guys have a seniority system here, too, don't you? A-P-T-U-O, P-P-U, I can't say those letters. You have it? Yeah. That's a great system. We don't have it in Alberta at all. So we have, we have no power, we have no commitment from the university at all to us. So. We quite often see people who've been teaching for 10 years and are really top teachers. They win awards, etc., replaced by, you know, the, the department chair's cousin, 
right, who just got their PhD or their MA or something, right? Um, <clears throat> closing that wage gap and the percentage trap, that's what motivates them to hire us, that's what makes it cheap labor, and we have to, we have to, and we have to convince our permanent colleagues that it's to their advantage that we do that, close that gap. They think that they're better qualified than we are and they deserve more pay. They don't. Most of us have the same qualifications or more, right? And I taught, and many of us have taught alongside our permanent colleagues knowing that our qualifications vastly outstrip those of our permanent colleagues. We know it, we see it every day. Um, we also need to make ourselves visible and we need to show that we're indispensable, right? And that's where becoming you know, the uh, subject of this conference comes in. I'm going to show you uh, something about slaying our sacred cows. I want to flip to a different form because PowerPoint does not play my video as well, so I've had to move in and out of it, sorry. This is, this is Frank Costco from Vancouver Community College. I just talked about him. And uh, he's going to explain a little bit about the contract they have there. And it, they call it the Vancouver model. And it's been featured actually in, a, in an American publication as an example of a, of a really interesting contract. And some of the Americans from the unions down there are coming up to Vancouver to study that contract. It's also a very similar contract is followed at some of the universities in FIPSI in the Federation of Post-Secondary Educators. Vancouver Island University has a very similar contract. It's not quite as well enforced and quite as strong as the Vancouver Community College one. And the Vancouver Community College guys are the ones who kind of modeled for everyone else uh, out there. And the, uh, but it's, uh, it's an amazing um, little company. And they, they are, their union cares for students too. They fight for students. They go to Victoria, they go to their provincial capital and fight for student rights along with the students. They've made wonderful alliances. And when we talk about coalitions that we need to make, we need to make a lot more of them. I know some of you really try hard to do this, but somehow we have to break through those barriers and get through and say that we're all in the same situation and we have to fight together. Because that, what, that's what makes change. We've been able to, in large measure, not completely, but in large measure, avoid that trap of uh, treating part-timers as the unions. Um, we've always had complete pro rata pay. So everybody from day one that is, is paid on this essentially the same uh, in the same way. So so if I teach a course, I get paid the same as a permanent person. If I come in to Right. To if you're on the same step as that person. Yeah. So say the permanent person is on step five, yeah. you get step placed with your first appointment, yeah. and you might get step five. Many people do. Yeah. So your pay is completely pro rata. Uh, if, if you teach 10 hours, you'll get what, whatever portion that 10 hours represents of that full time pay. And another real feature is that it's pro rata annually as well. You get Christmas holidays. The, the, the regular will get 44 days of vacation you'll get the same proportion of that. So we have a funny situation where some of our term people, they get 30% uh, add-on to their salary for the vacation time. And when they regularize, their pay is then spread, uh, it's every pay, it's spread out in the year. And their actual take-home pay every pay period goes down a little bit. Because, because these guys, when they're off contract, they get zero. Because they get paid over the summer. 30% more. So once in a while, I get calls. How come my pay went down? <laughs> because I went from the internal position to the regular. But it's all uh, prorated annually. At the end of the year, when they get their T4 slip, it'll say the same thing or completely prorated. So tell me about regularization. What does right. that mean? And a key feature of some people say oh, what's, what's good about our contract is when we have automatic regularization of the person, not the position. For example, in my old department, I taught in English to uh, immigrants. We had 100% regularization, over 100%. We had more regular people. What does regularization mean? It, it means you change your status from this term thing where you get a contract from January to June, or a three-month contract or a six-month contract. You change it to you just 
expected to keep working until you retire. And that's what you're a regular. We call that regular. And you can't be laid off without cause. So some people say it's a form of tenure. It isn't classic old style tenure, but it's pretty damn good. And you can't be laid off without uh, severance pay, uh, four months notice, right to transfer, and full support of the union to prevent the layoff. I prevented the person's layoff a couple months ago. So, but the organization is automatic. It's not contingent on anything. Okay. I'm going to skip ahead. I was going to show you another video, but we're running a little short. I'm going to show some videos, or a longer, a 12-minute video tomorrow at lunchtime. We're going to try for that. Anyway, if we can make the tech work. And we'll give you a little better idea of the range of stuff that I've been working on. Um, I promise to help you a little bit. And I'm going to say, so often with the public and even with our colleagues, um, what we have is competing stories. Um, we're academics, so we like to use categorization and analysis to look at things. And there's always a little bit in, in story. but. Um, People communicate by means of stories, and they understand things by means of stories. And uh, that's what we need to do. We need to tell stories. We need to tell our stories. And as much as we possibly can, that's how we reach the public. And just a little, in case you're not in English or, or remember from high school or whatever, what happens is, what do we have in stories? We have tension or conflict. And that can be real, we see it in front of us, or it can be implied. In short videos or in shorter stories, sometimes the tension is implied. It's, it's the tension between the stereotype that we might have had before and the reality we're seeing in front of us. So that tension can take many forms. Uh, we have character, and if we're interviewing somebody, I'm going to suggest in video stories, or even in written stories, we tell individual stories, testaments, witnesses, what what the experience of precarity is like for some of our fellow members. Okufa had a, well, I'll talk about this in a minute. Um, emotion. I'm in the drama business, and really it's all about emotion. And that is what our right-wing politici politicians are now man using to manipulate and win votes. They're scaring people about this or that, you know, whether it's uh, immigrants or it's, uh, you know, the, some other religion that, other than the mainstream, or it's, uh, you know, in, in Alberta we just had massive cuts in the new budget. Uh, they scared people about the provincial debt, which is actually one of the lowest debt to GDP ratios in Canada. And the NDP was actually retiring that debt. But they managed to scare them and they used it. They know how to use emotion. Uh, we need to use it too. Um, <clears throat> It, uh, stories also involve change. Uh, there's usually a progress from A to B, C, D, or Z, right, in a story. Something changes, right? That's what we see. It's a temporal art, and there is progression in it, just like music. Okay. Um, story. And I say written or filmed. I want to get back to that for a second. Uh, I couldn't find uh, any examples because I think Okuf has taken the stories down now. But about two years ago, when I was starting, when I was early starting on the film, they published, uh, they put on their website just a number of stories, uh, written stories, just people telling what it was like to be precarious faculty or contract faculty. And those stories were very profound and moving, and they made those people visible, even though we didn't see their faces. And in a way, written stories can be very powerful too. Uh, in our publications, on our websites, whatever, and they offer the benefit of being anonymous sometimes, right? They don't have to use the real name if you don't want in a real story. You don't have to show the person's face or use their voice, so they are protected. And that is a really an, an issue for all of us because we are precarious contract faculty. Precarious means we could be gone tomorrow, okay? And people are afraid of that. Even if their contracts suck, they still are afraid of losing them. Okay. Video story. If you do video stories, and I know lots of people are, actually, actually when I looked at, I noticed Okufa was using some video, video stories now, which is fantastic. Um, some of you will, this is a repeat of some of the things that were said actually at a CIUT conference about two years ago, sorry. But 
I want to spread the word and I want to help you folks, right? So, and this can be done by unions or, or associations or it can be done by individuals, right? You can simply put your stories up online, put them on YouTube, find a way to put them on Facebook, put them on whatever social media or other you use and, and try to find a way to get people to link to them, to share them, etc. Um, with video, it should be short. If it's online especially, people have a very short attention span, as you know these days, from watching your students sort of get up and walk out or fall asleep, right? I hope that doesn't happen, but... Um, grab their attention and show what it's about quickly, early in the video. And when I say short, I mean usually under two minutes, right? Usually, they often say under one minute, and they say you have to grab them in the first 15 seconds. I don't know if all that stuff is true. I think with our audience, if we're talking to um, our colleagues, certainly, they have a slightly longer attention span. Um, the, um, usually we have one main message, and this is borrowed from advertising. I, I, I worked with some advertising people one time, and this is what they insisted, that I didn't actually make ads, but they did, and they said, you want one idea, one main idea. There can be a couple of others, but one of them has to dominate. Um, you probably want to involve the, the uh, viewer emotionally, right? I talked about that in story as well. Usually you involve them through story, through character, through story, right? Sometimes you can just shock them, and people use that, but that's a more sensational technique that lacks depth, and you usually move people more and for longer if it's through character and story. Um, the advertising people call that the hook sometimes. Um, finally, you want a call to action. You want to, it, with your videos, you want to give people a, a website they can go to for more information, a phone number, something you want them to do. Join the union, go on strike with you, whatever it might be, or support the strike, right? Um, OPSU was masterful in, uh, during that 2017 strike in controlling the story, the public story. They were on the media all the time. J.P. Hornick, who you saw just a minute ago. I want to, actually, I want to show you that. Do I have time? Not much, eh? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to boogie on ahead. I'll show you some of this stuff tomorrow. But they were just amazing. They were, they were on all the television networks. They were on all over the uh, social media. And it was J.P. and uh, Hornick and some of the others who spoke so well. And the public was really on side. And they won over a lot of their students and their colleagues that way. That strike was truly amazing and historic, not just because it was big, but because they were fighting over the issue of contract faculty. That was one of the two major issues, and really was the major issue. And they, they got their, their permanent colleagues on side. Their permanent colleagues were out there on the picket line. When I was interviewing people on the picket lines, I was running into more permanent faculty than I was contract faculty on those picket lines. They were, they were in support. And that isn't always the story, as you may well know. In some of the universities that I have been at, uh, permanent faculty, some of them are great. We have lots of allies there. But there are some um, reactionary forces at, at play there sometimes. And we don't get them on side. They think, they see it as a zero-sum game. You know, if we get more, they get less. And th there might be a grain of truth in that on the short term. But in the long term, it's not true. All budgets are flexible, right? And people, somebody said to me, well, we're all frozen now, we can't do anything. I, I, never, I would never accept that. I would never believe it. Budgets are always flexible. Things can be changed, right? And you always have to go in with that attitude. If you, if you accept anything else, you are playing their game. Don't accept it. Okay. <clears throat> um, oh, the other thing is, obviously, a simple picture and clear sound, right? Sound is usually the biggest issue. If you're using one of these, and you can actually, so many of them shoot 4K video now, you could actually make good videos with these things, right? And young people do all the time. Turn them sideways, actually, not, not up and down, okay? Remember that? And uh, shoot them against a plain background, or one that um, tells a little bit about their story you know, show pictures of their kids or something, whatever is appropriate, right? Um, and, uh, but the sound, if you use one of these, you need a mic. You need to attach a mic to it. You need to f figure out how that's done. There's lots of ways of doing it. Go online and find out if you want. But uh, the sound that these things capture, 
usually is pretty terrible. So try to use a mic. Okay, uh, I was going to show you an example, but think back maybe to the teaser that I showed you. Uh, did it work? Did it have those things? Did it grab your attention and show what it's about early? I don't know. Do you remember? Did it do that? That was JP speaking, explaining the issue really quick. So we put the intellectual stuff up first, and we didn't wouldn't normally do that because it's not a good grabber to, you know, talk analytically. But she was so forceful and so good and so clear that we went, yeah, this grabs people's attention anyway. And she explained what it was about, right? And then we put. We, told, we showed the story, right? We put Amy on, and I always cry when I think about that stuff <laughs> because Amy was trying to support her three kids, right? And I don't know if that didn't get to you. You weren't watching, right? <clears throat> the, um, and there's a story there, too, and there's tension, right? She's trying to be composed, and she's losing that battle. She's also talking about her struggle to survive with her kids. And how is she going to send them to higher education? When she's working in it, she can't, she can't afford that money to help them out in the future. She can't put it into her RESPs, you know, because she doesn't have any money. Um, finally, at the call to action, we showed a strike rally. That was from the Ontario College Strike. And it expressed the word solidarity, which I can't emphasize enough. We need to listen to one another in spite of our differences. We need to find common goals and we need to move towards them. And I know you all know that, but it can't be said often enough, right? Um, good luck. I hope you can use video. Um, I hope you come tomorrow at lunchtime and watch some more stuff because I can show you a little bit more. We can talk about it in more detail and I can answer your questions then because we should have a little more time. Thank you very much. Thanks to APTPUO, fantastic union, and thank to all of you for coming. Thank you.